Hi, everyone. Welcome to our online service. We hope you enjoyed the first message in our new series last week, and we pray that you and your families have been trusting God to take things head on this week. We're looking forward to the next message in the series, so let's get to it. Welcome. We're glad that you have joined us today as we continue in our series of David, looking at uh, just the different hearts of David and and what his heart was made of. He, David was a complex person, as we're going to be learning through the series, much more complex than oftentimes the way we think of him when we just kind of think of the Sunday school, maybe version of David. So last week we talked about the warrior's heart of David, how he had a warrior's heart. Um, And we focused on the story of Goliath for the most part and the strength of his warrior's heart. However, we also looked briefly at a very dark time in David's life um, when his warrior's heart was really not channeled properly and his weaknesses were revealed because he wasn't using that part of his heart properly. Um, We're going to see, as we continue looking at the different aspects of David's life, that that's kind of true in every area of his life. His greatest strengths are also his greatest weaknesses. And that's really true for all of us, isn't it? Our greatest strengths, when they're not channeled properly, are also our greatest weaknesses. And the more extreme our strengths are, usually the more extreme our weaknesses are. And that was definitely the case for David. So today we're going to look at David's poet heart, the heart of a poet. Now, I, if, if that word is confusing you a little bit, I'm going to be honest. I didn't, wasn't really sure what to call this one. Um, we want, you know, we know that David wrote poetry, but we're not going to be looking at that so much as What I was trying to focus on was the idea of David's heart to understand the bigger picture, to to see that the things he was fighting for, um, there was a purpose behind it, uh, that David had a softness to him that was able to be sensitive to what was happening around him and the higher purpose. So um, as I was thinking about it, my son David... Uh, he actually belongs to a group called the Warrior Poet Society. And the mission statement of that group um, talks about the art of learning um, and being a warrior for higher purposes, um, being someone who's able to think and discern and use wisdom in standing for God and protecting others. And I just thought, well, that's kind of saying what I was trying to get to. So that's kind of where we came up with the idea of the heart of the poet. Um, the idea that David was a warrior who was a thinker, he was a protector, he was someone who had a heart that looked for the greatest, the greater purposes in what he was doing, someone who cared deeply and used their strength to bless others. And my hope is that we will see that that really should be the heart that we have, especially as men. Um, that we're, yeah, we, it's great for us to be warriors, but we need to be thinkers too. We need to be deep thinkers. We need to be people who think about our actions and the effects that they have on people. Um, we, we see in the many times in David's life that he had an understanding that his life had greater purpose and that his life was kind of a gift, if you will, that was given him in order to serve God's purposes. Now, for the purpose of this study today, we're just going to look at three kind of key stories or three incidents in David's life. And so let's let's jump in and look at that, um, kind of the lessons from the heart of a poet, if you will. Um, 
The first lesson I want to look at is kind of through his incident and his relationship with Saul, King Saul. And you're gonna, we're going to kind of be jumping all over the place. I want to encourage you, if you're going to follow along, maybe turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24, because that'll be our first place where we, we jump in. <clears throat> but from very early on in David's life, he had a relationship with Saul at different levels. Um, we know that he did everything from playing music for Saul to soothe him, uh, to being obviously his champion that defeated Goliath. He eventually becomes one of David, one of Saul's greatest generals. And he also ends up marrying Saul's daughter, Michal, or Michael, depending on how you want to pronounce that. Um, and yet... Early on in that relationship, Saul begins to get jealous of David. And that jealousy continues to grow and fester to a point where Saul actually ends up trying to kill David on two different occasions. Um, now, one of the reasons for that jealousy was because the people really started to love David. Uh, they would return home from battles and the people would sing that Saul had killed his hundreds but David had killed his thousands. And so, so Saul tries to take David's life on two different occasions, but David's able to escape with his life, but he has to go into exile. And he ends up living several years on the run from Saul in exile. Now, I want you just to put yourself in David's shoes for a minute, just starting right here. You've got to remember, the prophet Samuel had already anointed David to be the new king of Israel. He had already slain the giant. Uh, the people love David. He's already become a great warrior. Um, and even as a man on the run, he has managed to build a great army uh, of about 600 men who the Bible says there were some of the greatest warriors in the land who have come to fight uh, with David. And it's really easy to see how David could start at this point thinking, you know what? I really should be the king right now. I don't need to wait through all this. I shouldn't have to put up with Saul pursuing me. I already know that God wants me to be the new king. I already know the people love me. I already know that I'm, I've proven myself in battle and I've proven myself as someone that people will follow. But he doesn't take that spot. Instead, he allows Saul to pursue him. And we know that at two different times, David could have taken Saul's life. So we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we see that Saul is pursuing David. And Saul ends up going into a cave, the Bible says, to relieve himself. I'll let you use your imagination there. And David's men have told him, hey, look, he's, God's basically giving him to you. He's right here because David and his men are hiding in this very cave that Saul goes to relieve himself in. And so he's tempted. He's got to be very tempted to take Saul's life at this point. Instead, what does he do? He gets close enough that he could have killed him with a knife, but instead of killing him, he decides to just cut off a corner of his robe. And he says in verse six to his men, he says, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, with a small L speaking of Saul, the Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. And so David just has the corner of his robe and he lets Saul escape, get out of the cave, not even knowing that David was there. David waits till Saul and his army are a little distance off, and he stands up and he yells out to him, look, I have your robe. I could have killed you. Look at verse 10. He says, behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. So David's saying, look, King, why are you even chasing me? I have nothing against you. All the things you're hearing are, are false. Now I gotta imagine, at this point, now David feels like, okay, Saul will leave me alone now. Saul's not gonna keep pursuing me. He obviously sees I could have killed him, and I didn't. And Saul, of course, tells David that he won't pursue him anymore, but it doesn't take long before Saul is right back chasing after David spending all of his time as the king, chasing after this person who really has no interest in doing any harm to him 
Saul is proving himself to be a bad leader. So David has a second opportunity. We find this in 1 Samuel chapter 26. And in this incident, Saul and his men are camped out. They're sleeping. And David and a couple of his men sneak right into the center of the camp while everyone's sleeping. And once again, he's standing right over Saul and David's men tell him, this is your chance. God's handed him to you. Kill him. So instead, David doesn't kill him. He takes Saul's spear and his hydro flask. Just kidding, they didn't have hydro flask. Spear and his, and his, water, jar, his uh, water jar, and he sneaks away with it. And he gets away, and in the morning when Saul wakes up, once again, David calls out to them from a distance. Look, I have your spear and your water jug. And he kind of, he kind of makes fun of his guards. Some, you're doing a great job guarding your king. I could have killed them. And once again, Saul promises he won't hunt them, but he fails on that promise, and he continues to hunt them. <coughs> David was hunted by Saul for at least eight years hiding out in the desert, living in exile. And you would think it would have gotten to a point where David would have said, enough is enough. But David was so sensitive to the things of God. He trusted that God's ways were not his own ways. That God had a plan in the midst of the horrible things he was going through and that he needed to just continue to wait on the Lord. And that, in that time, he wrote some of the most beautiful psalms that expressed the anguish in his heart and yet showed the faith that he had in God. Look at verse, I mean, uh, Psalm 6. I'm going to read from just a little bit. Psalm 6, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it, rending it to pieces. With, no, with none to deliver. And then he goes on, verse 10. My shield is my God, is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. So here's David. He's, he's being pursued. He's living in exile. He's having to live in the wilderness. This is a guy who was living in the palace. He's married to one of the king's daughters, and now he's out in the middle of the wilderness, and yet he's able to say, God, I will give thanks to you every day. Well, finally, Saul was overtaken in battle from um, the Philistines. And rather than be taken by the Philistines, Saul falls on his own sword and kills himself. And word gets to David about Saul's death, and we find David's response in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. Let me just read a couple of words of, from verse 11 and 12 of chapter 1. It says, Then when David heard, it says, He took hold of his clothes and he tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. And then in chapter two, he has this long lament about Saul. He says, Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold in your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. See, think about that. What an insight that gives into David that he would still mourn for Saul even after his death. I mean, it's finally over. He's finally free of Saul. And yet he is sad and he is mourning. Why? He's mourning because Saul was the man that was over God's people. See, David always saw the plan and the heart of God in the midst of the hardships of life. And we all go through tough times in life. We all have times in life when we feel like we're being treated unjustly, when we feel like we're being treated unfairly, when life isn't fair, when we feel like we've worked harder than anyone else and we've sacrificed more than anyone else, and yet we're being treated unfairly. 
And so I guess the question I would have for us today, the lesson we can learn from Saul on this, from David in this incident with Saul is, are you able to wait on the Lord? Are you able to wait on the Lord when difficult times arise? Are you able to trust in God in those times? Are you able to see the greater purpose that David was able to see? Or are you the person who feels like, no, I got to take care of this on my own. I got to make sure this happens. I, I don't have the patience to wait through the tough times. Do you keep pushing through and finding yourself creating messes in your life because you want to make it happen in your time versus trusting God in his time? We need to learn to wait on the Lord. My, my guess is most of us will never have to face in our life as difficult a time as David faced here and being as patient as David was able to be while also being as sure of himself in what the future held. I mean, he had been anointed by the prophet. He knew what God was doing, and yet he still was able to wait on it and not make it happen. Well, the second story I want to look at is, is the story of what happens with David after, with the first son that Bathsheba bears to him. Okay, you remember Bathsheba. We're not going to get too much into the sin of David and Bathsheba. We're going to talk about that in a different week. But because of that sin with Bathsheba, she bore him a son. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you want to turn there, that's what we're going to be for this little part. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet Nathan visits with David. And Nathan tells David a story. This is right after David and Bathsheba with the sin and Uriah and all that. And Nathan tells David a story of two men, one rich man who had a whole flock of sheep and one poor man who had one small sheep that was more like a pet than part of a a flock. Well, that rich man has some guests. Well, rather than kill and slaughter his own sheep to feed the guests, he ends up having the poor man's sheep slaughtered and prepared for his guests. And Nathan said, after telling David the story, he asked David, what should be done to this man who did this? At which point, David kind of goes off in, a, in like a self-righteous indignation, just saying, saying how, how wicked this person is and what should happen to him. And at that point, Nathan looks David in the eye and says, you are the man. You are the man that this story is about. Now stop there for a second and think about that. Think, imagine how David had to feel at that moment. Horrible guilt shame, maybe even a little bit of fear about what this means and what he's going to have to face. But knowing David's heart, I also got to believe there was a little bit of relief. Relief that hiding it was finally over. Now also think about what went through his head. I mean, up to this point, he had managed to keep this sin a secret, at least to the point where anyone could prove it. I'm sure there were people that had their ideas and their thoughts. But for the most part, David felt, was able to feel like he'd gotten away with it. So he has to make a choice right now. He could have Nathan killed. He could have Nathan at least thrown into prison to just keep the whole thing quiet. Right? Now, we don't know if Nathan told David this in front of a lot of people or if they told it in private. But even if it was in front of a lot of people, it would have just sent a message that, hey, this is not an open topic. We don't, we're never going to bring this up again. And he wouldn't have had to deal with it. But instead, what does he do? The most powerful man in the country, what does he do? He repents. He repents. There's a lesson for our politicians, right? To just repent. To just admit and, and deal with the consequences. And so David admits his sin. At that moment, it shows that David has a sensitivity to God unlike almost anyone that I've ever known. 
You know, it was Abraham Lincoln that said, most men can handle adversity, but if you really want to test a man's character, give him power. Right? David had handled the adversity. He'd handled the time in the desert, in the wilderness. But now he's sitting in the palace, and he has all the power in the world. Yeah, he slipped. And he sinned, and he allowed that power, to, he allowed himself to use that power to hide his sin. But when he was finally called out on it, he came clean. And so Nathan said that God is going to forgive you for this sin. And yet, there is a consequence. The consequence is that your son, the son that Bathsheba is going to bear you, will die. And so David has to live with this as Bathsheba continues to go through the pregnancy and eventually the baby is born. And sure enough, the baby becomes afflicted with sickness. And so David goes and he mourns. Look, pick up at chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15. It says, And the Lord afflicted the ch child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted, and he went in and lay all night on the ground, and the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, he, nor would he eat food with them. Right? So what's David doing? Is he mad at God? Is he, is he saying, this isn't fair? Is he questioning God? No. Instead, he just repents, and he lays out before God, and he asked for the life of his child. He's asking God to have mercy on the child, but God doesn't, and the child dies. And David's servants are afraid to tell him about the child dying because they're like, if this is the way he's acting when the baby's sick, imagine the way he's going to behave when the child actually dies. But when David finds out, he gets up and he says this, verse 22, while the child was alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. What does he do? He humbles himself and he seeks God and he trusts God for the outcome. I don't know about you, but I'm humbled by that. I don't know if I could do that. He sought God. He sought for God to try to change God's mind. God didn't change his mind. And David accepts it, and he's able to move on with life. I'm sure he moves on always living with that pain. But he's continuing to able to see that God has greater purpose. It was also during that time that he wrote Psalm 51. If you've never read Psalm 51 or just reflected on it, I encourage you to do so. Psalm 51 is one of the most beautiful and vulnerable confessions ever written. A beautiful confession of his sin and his desire to be accepted by God, to be clean in God's eyes. See, David sinned in a way that most people will never fall to. And it's easy to think, man, how can this man be considered a man after God's own heart? But you got to understand, God never created a perfect human. We have all sinned. Only Christ is, is one that has walked this earth and been sinless. David made huge mistakes in his life. And in this instance, he made the mistake of allowing himself to live an unchecked life in the palace. He allowed himself to be in an unchecked position, no one to call him out, no one to watch his back so that he wouldn't fall. And he fell. But when he was finally called out, I think there was almost a relief as it was probably killing David to hold that in. See, the softness of his heart led him to repent not just privately, but publicly. He wrote Psalm 51 for the whole world to read. 3,000 years later, we still know, all, everyone still knows about David's sin because he was that vulnerable with his confession to just put it out there for all to see so we all could learn of the grace of God. To be able to trust God with the consequences of our sin. 
See, David didn't always do what God wanted, but he submitted to the heart of God. And I guess that's our second lesson I would ask you today. Are you able to own up to your sins? Are you able to own up to sin? No one expects you to be perfect. No one thinks you're perfect. Do you admit your sin? Do you understand the effects it has on other people? So the, because if you don't admit your sin, you can't deal with the sin. No one expects us to be perfect. And a poet's heart, the heart that serves a greater purpose, is able to come clean with our sin. It's able to accept the consequences and move forward knowing that God will not leave us, that he has a purpose for us, and that we're always his. And the only one we're fooling when we hide our sin is ourselves. Well, the last story I want to talk about is Absalom. <coughs> Absalom was David's son. Um, the story, this story shows us what can happen when we, when we lose sight of the important things. This is kind of shows the story, uh, shows us how David's poet's heart wasn't really activated and working like it should have been in this incident. And yet we can still learn from him. David forgot his higher purpose and, and he's made decisions in this case more based on guilt and fear and, and his own laziness. Now you remember David had multiple wives. Now sometimes people think that polygamy is condoned by God based on the fact that many people had multiple wives. But anyone who thinks that probably hasn't read any of the stories of the people that had multiple wives because it causes problem after problem after problem in every one of the stories. And it's not, that's definitely the case with David. David had one son named Amnon with one wife and another son named Absalom with another wife. Now, Absalom had a full-blood sister named Tamar, but Amnon became infatuated with Tamnar, and he eventually ended up raping her. And sadly, David did nothing about it. He forgot his higher purpose, his calling to be the protector, to stand for justice. And because it was his son, he turned the other way. He turned a blind eye. But Absalom became filled with hate for Amnon because of what he had done to his sister. And so eventually, two years later, Absalom has Amnon killed at a party. And Absalom flees and leaves Jerusalem and lives, ends up living in exile for three years. Now eventually, at the request of Joab, David's kind of right-hand man, David has Absalom brought back to Jerusalem, but he won't let him into his sight. So Absalom continues to live in Jerusalem, but nowhere near the palace for two years. And then finally, David allows him back into his life. But we don't see anything, any indication that David actually dealt with the issues. So before long, Absalom starts to undermine David and cause a rebellion, probably because he had fear that his da own dad still had, was going to do something because nothing was happening. Once again, David forgets his higher purpose, and he does nothing about it. He allows Absalom to continue his ways. And eventually, Absalom's power grows to the point where he overthrows David. And David now is living in exile from his own kingdom, having to live out in the wilderness. And eventually, he ends up going to war with Absalom. But while he's in exile, Absalom takes it even another step further to rub it in his father's face. He sets up a tent on the palace roof. And he has David's concubines brought into the tent. And he has sex with every one of his concubines, probably raping some of them. Just as a way to publicly shame his father. David finally goes into battle with Absalom but he may, gives the command that Absalom should not, cannot be harmed. Putting his own, more of David's men in harm's way, risking more of their lives in order to save his son just because he's a son. Even though his son deserves death, even though his son deserves 
to be punished. And it's the only way it's really going to end this. David's unwilling to. He loses sight. But thankfully, his right-hand man, Joab, ends up killing Absalom because he knows and now knows that that's the only way it can end. And when David finds out Absalom is dead, he's crushed. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33, it says, And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son. See, David allowed his guilt and his bad job and his role as a father to jeopardize his crown, his people, and his family. And we don't know a lot about David as a father, but it does appear he wasn't extremely active in that role. It also appears that he kind of turned a blind eye to the sins of his children. And then oftentimes a lot of parents do that. Many times because of their own guilt in making bad choices as parents. But remember we said that a poet's heart is all about learning the art of being a warrior with a higher purpose. It's about being someone who's able to think, to discern and be wise and standing for God and for protecting others. And this is one place where we see that heart was not really displayed in David. See, he waited too long to deal with things. It was too late. And his, in his efforts to try to redeem himself, he only ended up hurting more people. And so the lesson I would ask us for this, this story is, are you able to take responsibility for your roles? See, when we take on a call of higher purpose, like leading or having a family, we need to stay diligent. We need to be discerning and wise, and we need to come clean in our mistakes. And we need to be just while still being loving. See, David took on great responsibility, and in many ways, he did a great job with it. But with such high stakes, unfortunately, his failures were even more obvious. When we take on roles, whether it be the role of a husband, the role of a father, the role of an employee, the role of a boss, the role of a leader in a church. We have to understand the responsibilities that come with that role. And sometimes it means making very difficult decisions that we don't want to make. But if we don't make them, they only end up destroying us and destroying others and causing ripple effects that cause pain to so many others. We're called to many roles in life. And we're not going to live those roles out without hardships or faults or sin or without weakness. And the key is to keep in mind that we have a higher calling and a higher purpose in life. That our actions all have ripple effects, not just in our own life, but in the lives of others. And the greater our responsibility, the more that are affected. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you are a God of great mercy. Because as we see from David, we, we so often fall in our roles. We, we so often don't measure up. God, I thank you for the victories we have. I thank you for the times in our lives that we are able to stand. We are able to have your heart. We are able to think about the greater purpose. But God, there are times we're all going to fall. We're all going to fail. And David, God, if we learn anything from David, we learn that even a person who fails can still be a man after your heart if they continue to be sensitive to the things that you call them to. To admit their mistakes. To come clean in their sins. And to continue to learn and to grow in you. I pray these things in your name. Amen. We're going to head into our time of communion. I'm going to ask at this time the uh, whoever's the ushers.
pass out our communion elements. And as we're taking communion uh, during the time of worship, you can just go ahead and take the elements whenever you see fit. I, I want us to think about this. You know, David seemed to have this uncanny balance of living in the very real world while also keeping in mind the things of God and the heart of God. And you know, Jesus died so that every one of us can have a constant relationship with God. That all of us can be in constant communion with him. That all of us can kind of have, constantly have that mindset of David of, of looking for what God is doing in the midst of all the things that we're going through. Jesus died so that we can have that personal relationship with him. So as you take the communion elements today, I pray that they would just be a reminder to you of that gift. That these elements are just something that we take to remind us of the gift of continual relationship with Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. We want to be praying for you throughout the week, so make sure you get on the website or on the app and submit any prayer requests. And we'll see you guys next week.